Don't be the dressing room DJ. Let your pals take care of the tunes. Drive smart. Ian Crocker. What's happening, young man? Hi, how are you doing? How are you doing, mate? You alright? I'm right? good, mate. How are good, you? Good, good. Thanks for having us in your motor. <laughs> Pleasure. Now, the rule I make on everyone's car is no horsemen and captain. You happy with that? No what? Captain. <laughs> <laughs> Well, now you've said it, I'm going to have to do it, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing, mate? All right, happy I'm, to be back in Glasgow? I'm good. I love Glasgow. You can't Just beat you adopted home, uh, Of course, yeah. I've been coming here 21 years now and uh, love the place. Uh, what do you love about it? Just the whole city is fantastic, the people and everything about it. Uh, I don't even mind the rain. Bring it on. It's lovely. Uh, it's nice, isn't it? <laughs> do you get recognised a lot? Um, not that often because it's more the voice than the face and the voice is better than the face to be fair so <laughs> that's just as well but occasionally you do coming out glasgow central train station and uh, somebody will shout out a commentary line at you or something which is all very humbling if a bit amusing to those people who might be standing around near me at the time yeah, right let's go we're going world. to go uh, we're going to go to share, which share way we're going on. so that way mate <laughs> i'll keep you right yeah you tell I'm me where worst. to go i am the worst at this <laughs> We've got a Londoner and a Dundonian to try to get directions in Glasgow. What chance have we got? No, not from London, from Dorset. Oh, is it Dorset? Yeah, right? originally. Are you a, right are you a West Ham fan? West Ham, that's right. a long story. Yeah. Uh, we're going to come to that in a minute. We're yeah, just going yeah. to we're just going to talk a bit about um, what we're driving today. So this is your missus motor? Yeah, it is. Because uh, we drove up uh, to Scotland to spend the week here before doing Livingston Rangers on Sunday and Newcastle Bournemouth on Saturday. Mate, I actually feel like I'm sitting in the house listening to my telly when you talk, yeah? <laughs> I'm usually in my pants, so that's only different. <laughs> well, thank God you're not today. Which way are we turning here? Uh, left, mate. I'll keep you right. Um, no, so, left or right? No, I have <laughs> So, uh, did you let your missus do the, the long drive, eh? Nah, she doesn't like motorway driving or so she tells me, so right. it was all down to me. But I don't mind it. I'm used to driving the football grounds all over the place here and there, so fine by me. Uh, she's got you on toast, didn't she? Yeah, uh, totally, and utterly. Right, look, there's Hamden there, big man. Look, there it is. Yeah. Uh, what a place, what a place. You've covered loads of games at Hamden now. Yeah. Um, what's a, you got a particular favourite? There's been a few. Um, the Old Firm Cup final 2002 was some occasion. Love and Crance injury time winner. Oh, yeah. Um, Scotland, when they used to give the big nations a run for their money, like Germany and Just Spain and Italy. Sense. Yeah. Um, and 2016 when Hibs, after 114 years, finally won the Scottish Cup. That was a bit special, yeah. um, with apologies to Rangers, but you just felt 114 years coming out and amongst all the Hibs fans and players that day. It's only in Scotland that you need to say apologies to Rangers there, right? <laughs> because see, do you always get that? Huh? Uh, you say it like a Rangers all the time? Yeah, yeah. You're better uh, in that lane, mate. There'll, be, there'll be an apologies to uh, Celtic coming up as well. Uh, uh, is that, is that You've got to keep on the right uh, side, haven't you? You've got to keep on the right side. Um, driving there. Safety, how safety is driving was... Mirror indicate, is it mirror signal yeah. indicate? Good yeah. man. Um, but see, like Hamden comes in for a lot of stick with the atmosphere and stuff like that. Do you find that as well or do you, do you love it? Um, when it's full, it's brilliant. Yeah. Uh, I do think the pitch is a little bit far away from the stands for my liking, which uh, when it's not full does uh, obviously affect the atmosphere. But, you know, it's the National Stadium. I, I've, I've quite enjoyed doing games there over the years, in truth. Do they look after you, get Nice pie in that half time. Yeah, reasonable food in the uh, media room, you know. Um, what are we going to do? Oh, yeah, they're always closed. closed, they're closed. Come Typical, on. Typical, man. Roadworks everywhere you go. Deary everywhere. Me. Got Ian Crocker in the water. Get that road back open. What's up, mate? Yeah, I don't think I quite wield that sort of power somehow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but see, recently, like, obviously, there's not been too much to shout about. How hard is that to commentate on? It's been tough. I mean, I started commentating on Scotland in 1998, which was the last time they qualified for a major tournament. It's not my fault. I hasten to add that they haven't in the amount of time I've been commentating on them. But yeah, there's, there's been some low points through the years for sure. And I just hope with this playoff, you know, that, that maybe, maybe this time they could do it. It'd be great to see this group of players there, I think, but also the Tartan Army, of course, at a major tournament because I think they're getting right hacked off with not being able to go to one for so long. Well, you watch, obviously, you watch a lot of the Scotland team, so can they win the playoff? I, well, it, it, the first playoff semi-finals looks like it'll be Finland or Bulgaria at Hamden. You can't ask for much better than that, a home one-off home tie. Yeah. And then final could be Serbia, could be Norway, could be Trickia, whichever. So let's get through the semi-final first uh -huh. and then uh, then worry about the next. But I think they've, they've got a chance. Who are we to count our chickens? Eh? Exactly. You wouldn't get carried away with anything regarding Scotland at the moment. But I do think, uh, I do think the squad that... 
I say we as well because it, it feels like we, having covered them for so long, the squad that we have now is probably better than Northern Ireland's, better mm. than the Rep Republic of Ireland, better than Wales, apart from Bell. Uh, so really, you know, the, the, there's no excuses. I think they've got a good chance of making it to, the, to Euro 2020. Do you get much interaction with managers in Perth? Yeah, you, um, over the years there's been a few. Um, most commentators like to get an early shout on teams because it yeah. just makes you feel settled and you can do a bit of homework and get ready for the game. So uh, over the years, quite a few. Walter Smith was brilliant. Martin O'Neill used to write his formation down on a bit of paper, scrunched up and hand it to you as he came in the ground because I don't think he'd picked it until five minutes before <laughs> most of the time. Um, maybe these days managers are a little bit more cautious and uh, cagier, but Derek McInnes does the same, writes out a formation for me. Uh, so we've got him well trained, just oh, have to brilliant. work on a few others. <laughs> <laughs> you say that we, like, see when you're no commentator on Scotland, do you still want to see them do well? Be honest. I do. I do uh, uh, it, there were times uh, over the 21 years when obviously we didn't have the rights to Scotland and I would be, I'd watch Scotland ahead of England because I feel an affinity right. to uh, Scotland having covered them for so long, having covered the game up here for so long. And uh, plus the wife was born in Dundee. Uh, I'm for Dundee. I know, yeah, I know, yeah. She left uh, when She's she was got very... She's got fat Sam's. No. Well, good story she left. Me, and, me and your life. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Thankfully, she left when she was a child. Oh, I did, uh, she, right, okay. she walked out of her own accord. No, I'm just kidding. Dundee. No, so she, was, she, was, she was very switched on at a young age to get the fuck out of Dundee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, see, like, just now as well, we were saying that obviously it's not been great. Is there ever times that you, like, if somebody does something really bad, do you ever feel like just going, oh, that's pish? Well, we always have a saying that it would be great to do a really honest commentary one day, but uh, I think you'd have to either be about to retire or having just won the lottery to do uh -huh. it. Although if I did win the lottery, I'd still like to carry on commentating. So, you know, it might be the day you retire. But yeah, of course, sometimes you, you just want to go. You want to say what the fans are thinking, but uh, obviously you, you have to keep your professional head on and uh, keep it clean and keep it safe. Uh -huh. Would you say you are, like a vo a, are you essentially a voice for the fans or has it, has it got to be un unbiased? Um, I think when we do Scotland, uh, we're going to get out of this road, by the way. Well, I think when we do uh, Scotland, you, you can afford to be biased because most of the audience wants Scotland to do well. So, yeah, we, we're a bit pro-Scotland. Obviously, you can't do that at club level, even though some people think we do. Um, so, yeah, I think we back Scotland. I wouldn't say we're the voice of the fans because I think the Scotland fans have got a big enough voice of their own. Uh, how good is it when Hamden's rocking? Do you remember the best atmosphere? I think when, uh, I remember when Germany came there and Spain and Italy when they were so close to qualifying under Big Egg, yeah. um, the place was, was right, rocking yeah, um, and just fantastic. Uh, it's been quite a while since the Scotland team actually gave one of the big boys a, a proper run for their money, you know. I'm not yeah. saying they beat them all the time, but at least they knew they were in a game. And, and uh, so, yeah, Hamden's great for that um, when, it, when it's full, um, obviously. It hasn't been full much lately, so let's hope we can get back to where we were on that front. You did never get a beer after that, eh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we do that, yeah. Uh -huh. um, um, yeah, or a glass of red wine normally. Um, what, did you ever get? Did you ever have a beer with somebody, like a famous player or that up here? Um, I tell you, uh, I, I tell you, I did have a beer with when he first came, and that was uh, Fernando Rickson. And did you, right? Yeah, uh, what a lovely guy. And... Um, God bless him, and uh, yeah, I forget which hotel it was, but we had a lager, and he was he was chatting away, and he was saying about the old firm, and I said, oh, there's nothing like it, and he said, oh, I played in derbies in Holland before, and I went, Fernando, forget it, there's nothing like it. And I remember in his first, oh, I had to go right there, mate, his first two uh, his first two old firms, he got sent off in one and roasted by Bobby, Bobby Petter, Petter yeah. in the other, and he came up to me afterwards and went, you were right, and. Uh, and every single time we did Rangers, since we had that beer in the hotel, without fail, he'd always come up, shake hands, say hello, and I thought. And that, along with many other things, summed up the guy. Oh, brilliant. So you had the beer one before his first old firm game, huh? Yeah, well, when he joined Rangers, it was uh, it Was, was a just a chance he, meeting, like? Just a chance meeting. We happened to be in the same hotel, and uh, clocked who he was. And he was, uh, he was different class. I mean, what a, what a character. Um, and uh, his illness was just uh -huh. tragic. When did you get like the buzz for commentating? Did you, were you just following like John Motson home and away? Uh, <laughs> I was actually listening to Radio Two, which is which is which would be five live now, but was sport on two back then. A guy called Peter Jones did commentary. Right. You know, long before your time, but a fantastic voice. I used to listen to him whilst watching Weymouth, my local team, and have the radio there listening. And I thought I wouldn't mind doing that. And uh, eventually fell into it. I actually got a job at, when I moved to London at the age of seventeen. 
I was a bit of a country bumpkin in London, didn't know what I was doing. And, uh, oh, I know uh, what you were doing. No, 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 I wish I was. I wasn't even doing any of that. <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah, so uh, I got a job at West Ham doing the Tannoy public address. Right. And, that's, and from there, I met guys from Capital Radio and sort of got into it that way. So it's, uh, it was an unusual way to, to start commentating. See, just on West Ham, who was your heroes when you support West Ham? Was McAvenny one there? And McAvenny was there, and uh, Cotty. I joined them just after that year when they finished third. Should, right. have, should have won the title. McAvenny yeah. and Cotty were magnificent. Um, so I was there for four years, started the year after that. Just missed the good year again. Imagine Frank um, taking you in London. You what, sorry? Imagine Frank taking you for a night. Yeah, year. well, oh. I think he took, a, he took a few guys out in London. But, Never came um, back. Yeah, uh, yeah. I heard a few stories of Frank. Bumped into him at Mr. Singh's Curry House the other week, actually, um, where we were regaling a few stories. But like, see, on the commentary front, is there somebody that would somebody come to you and say, "By the way, you've got a voice for commentary," because that voice is tremendous, isn't it? <laughs> well, it doesn't. It's just my voice. It doesn't feel like that to me. Have but, you had uh, to work on it or that? No, it's just not really. No, no. I think um, sometimes I feel a feel I sound a bit high pitched when I get too excited. So. I've tried to calm myself down a bit in recent years. Whether that's worked or not, I don't know. Because mm-hmm. you're watching games and you naturally get excited, don't you? So your voice goes up and up and up. But, does the so. voice matter, though? Does it matter to... Well, does it make you a better commentator? The uh, distinct voice? Yeah, I think so. Because, uh, you know, if most commentators, you don't want to sound the same as everyone else, do you? No. So hopefully I don't. Although the missus says that I do sound like a few others. So. No, you don't, mate. You're but she doesn't know what she's talking about anyway, so that's fine. <laughs> What about uh, other commentators? Who else do you rate? Who's, who's the best in the business? Well, when I was growing up, it was pretty much John Motson, Motson Barry yeah. Davis and Brian Moore. I used to love Brian Moore and got to meet him, actually. Well, all of them. But, uh, and he was a, a lovely guy. And then we started doing games in England when John Motson and Barry Davis were doing Match of the Day highlights and all that. Uh, you know, legends of the commentary game, to be fair. And in Scotland, there's been a few, obviously, you know, um, uh, the legendary ones of yesteryear I know Archie. all about. Yeah. Woof. And, uh, and, and there's something about the Scottish voice that lends itself, not just to commentaries, but to most things, actually. But there's something about that voice that just adds a bit to a commentary as well. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, I haven't got that accent, uh, despite all my time spent here. So, you know, hopefully but make up it in other ways. You're saying that about the Scottish accent. So why do you think Scottish football has picked you as the voice of Scottish football? Then? Um... Well, it kind of happened, funny enough, I've always had like Scottish bosses over the years, wherever I've worked. Um, when I worked for Capital Radio, it was Richard Park, who used to be at Clyde and, and then... Sorry to interrupt you, mate. I'm sure Stanley Park's about your summer. <laughs> yeah, let me, let me think. Oh, yeah. You're not waiting for it again, man. I'll do it this way. Right, uh, so your bosses are Scottish, sorry. Uh, yeah, Richard Park at Capital, he used to be at Clyde. A guy called Andy Melvin at Sky, he was a big Aberdeen fan. Um, so... They offered me the gig when Sky got the Scottish football full time. I've been doing a bit of work for them here and there. And um, I thought, great, sounds good. Um, never thought I'd be doing it 21 years later. So it's been, uh, it's been great fun. Did you know much about Scottish football before you done it there? Yeah, I followed it quite a bit because um, when we did uh, radio at Capital, uh, we, we used to do, because obviously Celtic and Rangers fans are everywhere, aren't they? Mm-hmm. Quite a few in London. Uh, so we used to do a little feature on, on the old firm and all that most, most weeks. So I've always watched uh, the games over the years and, you know, there's some iconic matches and players and fixtures uh, and some of the, the old coverage of it is, is brilliant. I love watching yeah. it still. Uh, we stop in here? Um, uh, we'll stop here. Why yeah, not, mate? Stop we'll have a wee bit, a bit oh, You can go up a bit here. Let's go up Just the Celtic way, shall we? Just pull up to the front door. Let's... <laughs> We can do what we like about they, here. They put the barriers up, they knew you, you were coming back. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I was in the reserve, I was doing it at Barrafield. Ah, right, the yeah. first team players that came up here. Look at that. Tremendous, though. Yeah, they've done a great job with this walk, is not it? You get a wee uh, buzz when you go into stadiums like Celtic and, and Rangers. Yeah, there, all the big stadiums, I love it. Um, and and some, of the, some of the new builds, you know, in the Premier League, maybe not so quite, lost a little bit of the feel of the old grounds. But Celtic and Rangers, certainly, when you, you get near them and, and you see them, yeah, there's always a buzz, and obviously when they're full, fantastic atmospheres. Glasgow does an atmosphere like uh, no one else has proved on Champions League nights over the years. You know, I, I mean, it's a, such a shame that we don't the champions don't get automatic uh, entry into the Champions League. Yeah. They, they should perhaps we'll get back to that one day. But you know, UEFA must love it when they look at Celtic Park or Ibrox on a European night and see it all kicking off and going mad and noise and everything and pride and passion. Brilliant, that's what it's all about. Isn't it? Are you the same as players? Do you get a wee bit nervous before a game? Um, not really. I used to before some of the big games like the All Firm. Right. Uh, because it does raise the stakes a bit when you you know, you just want to get through a game, make sure you get everything right. 
uh, and not making a mistake, um, basically. But also, you want to enjoy the occasion and call it right. And if something great happens, you want to come up with a line that hopefully people will remember. It's a bit embarrassing when they remind you of that. But, um, but that's what it's all about. We're trying to capture the moment. But it's all down to the players, really. They're the ones that are, that are doing the business. Have and, you ever uh, made an asset? Yeah, I have. Yeah. yeah, I've made a few over the years. Um, Doing this interview. Yeah, that, that was a good <laughs> jump Bad to the top, eh? top of the list, actually. <laughs> now, I remember been mistaking Barry Ferguson and Nacho Novo in an old firm game once, calling the wrong goal scorer, actually. Oh, no. Um, yeah, that was a bit embarrassing. Not many people seemed to notice it at the time, so I, I probably shouldn't have mentioned it now. So, do you get but, pulled up for stuff like that? Yeah, Your boss is that? I, I like to think that most of the time we're, uh, we kind of get it right. Um, and get it spot on. So I think if you make the odd mistake, like in any line of business or in any job or in life generally, you know, you're going to make the odd mistake about things. And I'd like to think I'm in credit, but I did make, my biggest handle was on radio years ago covering Birmingham City. And they had a player called Jonathan Hunt. And I was trying to say Jonathan Hunt oh, no. cuts inside. I had to think about it there. <laughs> you can probably guess what came out. Uh, so I'm one of the few people who've actually said that word on the radio. Brilliant, I love that. I, re I reacted in a, in a very professional way by giggling for the next half hour. Well, I've, in, I've interviewed a few of them, don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> prominent moments at Celtic Park covering games? Uh, the 6-2 game, Martin O'Neill's first Old Firm match. Celtic three up in 11 and a half minutes. Uh, fantastic game. Barcelona, obviously, that, there was something special about that night when a lot of fans in Scotland get to their seat late, I find, later yeah. than in most countries. Because uh, you know, they're in the pub, Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, obviously. But that night, it was buzzing from about 7 o'clock, and there was a real feel about the place. And uh, I remember thinking, saying to Davy Brother, this, you know, this, there's something about this place tonight. But you're thinking they couldn't possibly go and beat Barcelona. And, of course, they did. And, mm. uh, Is that Tony Watt, yeah? Tony Watt, uh, with the moment of his life, yeah. uh, which certainly came early. And, uh, you know, Lenny masterminding a, a fantastic result against Barcelona. And uh, yeah, everyone went on about how much possession Barcelona had. Well, yeah. Who cares about possession? Who cares? They lost 2-1 and that's it. See, when you do that, like you've obviously commented on Tommy, Tony Watt scoring that goal. Do you feel like you're, you're part of his career? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. It was, um, pe people say as well, um, you know, do you think up lines in advance of what you're going to say? And, and sometimes you do, but really, if you do that, it never quite happens the way you think it's going to happen. And uh, I think I said something about he takes his place in Celtic folklore. Um, and, and this is the, I think I said this is the stuff of legends, yeah. which annoyed me because I think it's legend, isn't it, rather than the S. And it's little things like that that commentators pick up about themselves. It doesn't really matter ultimately, but I think it's, I don't think I should have put the S on the end. So, so. do you, do, see if you've, <laughs> see if you've like, made a bit sad, is it? <laughs> <laughs> that is very sad, mate. Come on, you've cut yeah. yourself some slack, man. <laughs> You're um, right. Do you watch it back to see how you've done? Uh, Sometimes, but I don't particularly like the sound of my own voice. Um, you know, so, but on the big games, yes, if you're being honest, you want to make sure you called it right. You want to make sure you hear it. So sometimes you'll hear, they'll play the commentary on Sky Sports News and you hear it about them. But I don't watch games back to the extent that I used to, but um, I think you always live in learning this job. And there are some things that you end up saying too often in a commentary. See, I'm being hard on myself again, maybe. Uh, just repeating myself. And no, I know what you mean, because I do that. I feel like I do that in interviews as well, eh? Yeah, uh, yeah, you're right, actually. No, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, the one that I've got here is when Henrik Larson scored. That is sensational. Yep. Was that pre-planned, there? No, that was uh, not pre-planned, but it was such a wonderful goal. I thought, right, I thought the idea was, as I was often told over the years, keep it simple. So I didn't go overboard on words because I thought the goal kind of spoke for itself so that is sensational kind of worked and everyone picked up on it as well and to this I was coming out of Glasgow Central the other day after a long train journey and some lad came up to me and shouted that is sensational at me um, I thought after 19 years on I better come up with a new line soon if they're still remembering that one but it was a special goal Henrik uh, did the hard bit I just came up with three words that's yeah. the way I look at it maybe the, guy, maybe the guy was talking about your band because that is sensational <laughs> what's the thinking behind that yeah I know well 54 now and uh, well, mate. I've tried it flat mate but it doesn't work um, I like it. But uh, there was uh, a game we did at Tannadice once, and there was a wee ball boy about nine years old came up to me and said, uh, Why have you got spiky hair? I said, Well, I don't know, I've always just had spiky hair, and that's the way it is. And he went, You're too old, fella, too old for spiky hair. <laughs> I'm getting breached by a nine year old in oh, Dundee. Honest in Dundee, <laughs> tremendous. Right, mate, we're going to shoot over at uh, Ibrox. Righty ho. The team you supported as a boy. I'm kidding. No, 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 calm no, down. No, I'm only no, no. joking. Unbiased of Glasgow. Calm down, of course. You're the unbiased person in Glasgow. Have you got to like rest the voice or not? Like a singer, no? 
not really. Um, used to get a lot of throat infections years ago, which uh, which made it tricky at times. I remember doing a heart Celtic game, which I'd never done because I virtually lost my voice, mm. and it was really gravelly and. But commentators are selfish, so and so, so you just end up doing the game rather than let someone else do it. And sound a hell of a lot sexier. Yeah, it wasn't even sexy actually. No. <laughs> and uh, Jan Venegor Hesselink scored, and I thought, trust him to score the, the longest, longest name <laughs> on the planet. And, and I can't really say Big Jan, although I felt like it, rather than his whole name. So I said his whole name, and that finished me off. But Brilliant. no, See, thankfully the throat's been in reasonably good order in the past few years. So. Sorry, I just want to go back to Celtic. I wanted to ask you because you mentioned Martin O'Neill. Would he? Uh, would you get a chat with Martin O'Neill and stuff like that before and after games? Martin would. Um, Martin was a guy that you never really got overly close to, but I got on with him and he would speak to you. And I mentioned that he'd he'd write his team out on a crumpled piece of paper yeah. and hand it over to you um, just before or just after he'd arrived at the ground. But I think he was so late picking his team because a couple of times he came back out or John Robertson came out and just made a change on that bit of paper rub one name out and put another one in so I think he was changing his team right up to the last minute last but minute, right? we did a, a Scottish Cup game Hearts Celtic and we were staying in the Marriott by Edinburgh Airport and Celtic were there as well and uh, I was the only one around from Sky and I sat and had a couple of glasses of uh, wine with him for a couple of hours which is the longest I've spent in his company and he was absolutely fascinating what a guy what a yeah. character and I would have liked to have got closer but I don't think he was, you know, I don't think he was that sort of person. But if you did get some quality time with him, you certainly remembered him. Some yeah. guy. What was it? He's Brian Clough story, isn't that? Uh... Yeah, a few of that, a bit of everything. We just chewed the fat about so much, uh, quite mostly about Scottish football at the time and everything. Um, and he was on tip-top form and, um, you know, but on a match day, Martin was a different character, which showed in the, the way his teams played and the, mm. with what he won as well. He walked past you on a match day and, and he... It was like you weren't there. And I don't think he was doing deliberately. He might have been. Yeah. No, he, I think he'd he, done that to the players as well. He, days yeah, that he just, walked he just by in that uh, zone, wasn't he? He was yeah. like, just in that zone where, you, you know, you didn't even bother speaking to him. Yeah. But I remember uh, he, he walked up to me. I didn't know he was coming. He walked up from behind at one game and gave me the old back and knees job that made me nearly fall over. Did he, Martin O'Neill? Did yeah, he? called me a fat bastard and then <laughs> walked, walked off. But he'd already won the title by then. So that was, oh, was, that was a, a rare look at a relaxed Martin on a match day. It was, uh, it was good. Boredom can creep into long journeys, travelling to grounds. How important is it not to be distracted by looking at your phone or messing about with the music? Very important, yeah. I mean, uh, not something I ever do. I do see people doing it on the many journeys that I make and it's, you know, you, you're never going to be in control of your car, are you? And you can yeah. see it with people, they're like wobbling and all that. So, um, it's easy to do it in this day and age, but not something I've ever particularly uh, entertained. And Right, we're on route to Ibrox. Talk us through your match day preparation during a big game such as Celtic and Rangers, and then we're going right, mate. Yeah. Good, um, good, good. Yeah, red light, always stop at them. Yeah, good, man. Match day preparation, uh, if it's a 12.30 game, which it often is in Scotland, or 12-ish, always up early on a match day, always up about 7. Buzzing, ready oh, for yeah. the game. Yeah, a bit of scrambled egg on. Um, oh, a bit of sorry, night before bed early. Yeah, yeah, a couple of glasses of red maybe, and uh, sleep, yeah. yeah, and um, uh, scrambled egg and mushrooms on toast. Oh, lovely! If you stay in a hotel, you can't have a fry up all the time, can you? Well, you could actually, and I look like I do, but I don't. <laughs> uh, I wasn't so, going to say it. Uh, I stick to the scrambled egg and mushrooms, and uh, and then I've, I've always got my clipboard on me with all the information, and you have a think about what you're going to write for team news, which is one of the few things you do script um, when the teams come up in formation, and you have a think generally about what might happen in the game but you can't think too deeply about that because basically you're out living for 90 minutes you haven't got a clue what's going to happen so um you take it as it comes but it's basically getting your head clear you're a bit like footballers really yeah. but um probably without the couple of glasses of red wine the night before <laughs> oh, no, I do that as well. maybe not uh, what about um, the derby how does it compare to others that you've done uh it, it's the one there's nothing quite like it uh absolutely unique sporting occasion yes it comes with a bit of baggage sometimes too much but you know, as a as a contest and as a game and as an event, it's just breathtaking to do. I've done almost 60 of them now, right. and I can't remember a bad one. The first one I did, funnily enough, I had that lane, please, first one I did was a nil-nil draw back in '98. You uh, had a drink, man. Uh, Ibrox. <laughs> uh, there haven't been many nil-nil since yeah. then, because there's nearly always something happening. Um, and just love the love the games, love the occasion, um, and great to commentate on. But you got to be so, you, I always feel quite tired afterwards because you're, you're so focused and concentrated on the game yeah. and there's so much going on, you know, a bit, bit harder if you're the referee, I suppose. Because that's what I was going to say, right. I ask players this that play in the game, like, can you actually enjoy it? 
And they say no. No. But as a co- can you enjoy it as a commentator? I enjoy it, yeah, because it's the it's the, one of the best games you could do. And I've been extremely fortunate to be able to do almost 60 of them, hopefully a few more to come. So yeah, I've always, you know, I've always got the buzz for it. I look at the when the fixtures come out, it's it's the first one you, you look for. I like all derbies. And uh, I've been I've been fortunate enough to do a few. Sunderland Newcastle was great. Birmingham Villa, bonkers. Um, but nothing quite comes close to uh, the old firm. Rangers, yeah. uh, You said about sometimes it goes too far. You ever had stick for fans? I have, yeah. Game, yeah. We're going over that way? Uh, yeah, that way, mate. Yeah. I have had stick, yeah. I get a bit on Twitter uh, after a game, normally accusing me of bias, which of course I'm not, but nobody believes me. I'm, you know, Celtic have been winning most of the games lately, so generally it's the Rangers fans who give it, ah, you're a Celtic fan and all that. But coming from a little village in, Sutton, in uh, Dorset called Sutton Point, there weren't many Rangers or Celtic fans around back in the day when I was growing up. So I genuinely am a neutral in Glasgow, even though no one will probably still believe me now. Does that, does that, um, does that blow your mind that it's like that here? Not really, because the, the people tell it as it is, and I like that. I'd rather yeah. it was that way. Uh, it, it goes with the territory for me. Sometimes it can get a bit angry and a bit unnecessary and you can get all sorts of names but listen you can you, uh, it doesn't bother me one bit um, you say you've had it on twitter but i mean have you actually heard it at grounds yes uh yeah you can be walking past and you get a bit of uh, dogs abuse but listen <laughs> it's part of it's part of the fun i don't get as much as the cocoms uh Andy Walker, uh, that's what i was going to say so Andy, David Proven, uh, but, okay, what's the worst you've heard them get uh, i don't think i could repeat it here but they get a fair bit of stick but the best one that i got was rangers fans at aberdeen a few years back right started singing you're just a fat harry potter at me which <laughs> at least was a, original and better than the usual stuff that you're gonna hear and, uh, uh, do, you, do you mind it now nah that made me laugh i gave him the thumbs up and uh, a few of them waved back shall we say yeah it's there mate the same for Ibrox. i know yeah it made it easy um so yeah he did get a bit of stick but listen i've never been I've never been one to let it bother me it, yeah. it's part it's part of the territory and in many ways it's part of the fun sometimes when it goes a bit more than banter you, you do worry about it. Uh, I think there was a death threat online somewhere a few, a few years ago. But Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> that all calmed down. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, so listen, part of the territory for me, and as long as people generally don't overstep the mark, then, you know, it's uh, long may it continue. Imagine me and you on Cocoms. I don't think I'd be getting it. a word, didn't to be fair, oh, would I? I, mean, I would love that, man. Is it an ambition of yours? I don't know. Yeah. Now, it is, now that I've met you, it is, isn't it? You want to do can it? I sit, can I sit on your knee? <laughs> is Andy Walker ever trying to sit on your knee? No, he never does. i tell you what did make me laugh years ago when we were doing Scotland. I Go think it was it. San Marino or Estonia or one of those nations. And um, we're at Hamden and we're trying to get a formation out of, uh, say it was San Marino, for example. Up to the left here. And, uh, and David Brovin says, right, I'm just going to go and ask the manager. So, uh, oh, here we are, look at that, we'll go right actually, sorry mate. Yeah, I was wondering where you were going uh, there. Yeah, I know, I was lost for a minute there. Did you not want to go there or? No, no, no. it doesn't bother <laughs> me mate. <laughs> so, uh, Robin marches up to this manager, San Marino, puts a bit of paper in front of him with a pen and says, formation, formation. Did he? And the guy thought that he wanted his autograph. <laughs> and he signed his autograph. <laughs> and I'll never forget the look on David Robin's face, because I don't think he spent his whole life wanting the autograph of the manager of San Marino, whoever it was somehow. So uh, it was just fantastic. Shall right. we pull in here? There you go, big man. We'll get famous my lunch. old iconic what arena. Fa- what do you fancy? Look at them. <laughs> Me burger? Yeah, uh, probably. <laughs> Jumbo <laughs> sausage. Uh, what, what, what we saying? Lovely stadium, that. Fantastic. Like Celtic Park. Even those gates there. I mean, there's something iconic about them, isn't yeah. there? And they're just the gates, but something iconic about them and the, the history of the place and the just the way it's built. Um, yeah, I mean the two Glasgow club grounds. You know, when you walk into the I still after 21 years of working in Glasgow, it still gives me a buzz, and I think, wow, you look around. What I do is we get here quite early on a match day as well, mm-hmm. so we'd be here probably three hours before kickoff. I will walk in, have a little walk around the ground, just to. It's Take funny how on. an empty ground can have an atmosphere. Wow! And these two have Celtic Park, Ibrox, partly because you know what's coming a couple of hours later as well. But you just walk around. There's a feel. There's a f- proper football feel to these places it's hard to hard to put into words which i should be able to do but yeah no fantastic iconic arenas so where was your season ticket before you started commenting it was at weymouth <laughs> i'm only winding you up big man long long way you down on the south coast <laughs> all right you said your favorite celtic memories at, at celtic park what about rangers uh captivating rangers, moments rangers a good few european nights here as well back in the day um a few more coming back now um I remember some old firm games. There was one where I think they beat Celtic 4-2. 
Um, Gabriel Amato. Yeah, remember him? Scored, yeah. Great celebration as well. Did you know that? Or somebody done it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was that, that fantastic celebration and the place was uh, was jumping that day. There's been so many at these grounds over the years that it's hard to pinpoint, you know, there's probably more that I can remember so I can't actually come up with one mm. major one. Right, OK. What in, in terms of managers here? Obviously, met, ma mentioned Martin O'Neill. Uh, much dealings with Walter Smith? Yeah, a lot of dealings with Walter. Um, How is he? Walter was just... Outstanding for me. Um, as soon as we met, we hit it off. I think I think he's he's like that with a lot of people. But when you're asking a manager for their team, maybe the night before or the morning of the game, just to give you a head start, some of them can be a bit cautious. But Walter was never like that. Used to ring him at eight thirty on a Sunday morning. And we'd still be chatting half an hour later, chewing the fat. Really, right? He'd give you the team. There was a trust and respect that. Uh, Craig Brown was the same actually when he was at Scotland they just totally trusted you like you're ever going to go into the opponent's dressing room anyway and go hey I've got their team if you want to <laughs> but no he just trusted you and respected you and um, obviously with his career he had in football he was always worth a listen as well and um, uh, just a great guy to deal with and and totally trusting See when somebody's that good to you, do you find it hard to like, criticise them on comments? No, not at all. Not at all. Because I think they respect you more if you had to say something bad. Yeah. They respect you more. They do. We like to call it as it is. That's the plan. You know, hopefully we get it right most of the time. But no, I would never do any favours to anyone because if something's got to be said, it's got to be said. And I think, uh, yeah, these are straightforward guys who've been there, seen it, done it. I think they'd appreciate that as well. That uh, if we had to criticise then we would. Love and that I, for you. And nobody's really ever had a problem. One or two maybe. That was my, that was my <laughs> next question. Have you ever been pulled by a manager? Uh, yeah, I, was, uh, I felt like with Gordon Strachan once. I like we Gordon now. You're not the only get, one. I'd have been disappointed if I hadn't. <laughs> um, it was a Celtic game at, at Hibs where they were 2-0 down and it was Tony Mowbray's Hibs team. Right. And they were playing Celtic off the park. Although Celtic actually got two late goals and a 2-2 draw. But uh, when they, Hibs scored their second to go 2-0 up, I said that Gordon Celtic could be well and truly put in their place and um, he took great exception to that and uh, left me a message on the Monday morning on my phone no. asking to ring me which I did but we never we kept missing each other's calls he'd obviously calmed down a bit by then uh, but and we didn't have a Celtic game for about three weeks but I knew the wee man wouldn't have forgotten so uh, <laughs> when I saw him he came up and he was uh, he was having a pop about it and I said it, he said he felt it was disrespectful and I said I don't think it was Hibs were playing magnificent football and anyway, you got a 2 2 draw out of it. But, um, you know, again, he's a passionate guy, isn't he? Yeah. And uh, I, I enjoyed watching his teams, and uh, we made up uh, We made up a couple of years later. It was all right. right. Okay. And, and I always made the point of when he won the title or a trophy, going up to him and saying congratulations. And, and uh, you should see him on the same plane now and again, coming to Glasgow a few times. And he was great, and he was good, uh, good to us when he was in charge of Scotland. So it was a long time ago that. And like I say, I think it, it comes with the territory that uh, you've got to have a wee fallout with Gordon, otherwise you're not part you're of the You're not proper... doing it right. Uh -huh. No, exactly. <laughs> but that, that's just side like of the commentary that people don't really see, eh? Because when you think of a commentator, you wouldn't think that, that managers would... So they obviously watch the game back and listen to what you've said. Yeah, well, they all say they don't, don't they? Some of them yeah. say, I never never read the papers, never watch... Uh, I'm sure quite a few of them do, but most of them are, most of them are fine. Honestly, there haven't been uh, many issues. I don't think most of them care what we say anyway. That's no. a, that would be the... Um, the general thing, and nor should they, because uh, you know they, they should know more than uh, than I do certainly, and and, and that's the case. So th those sort of incidents have been few and far between. Most uh, most managers over the years have been pretty good to deal with. The festive period. Do you enjoy that time of year with the games on our? I do. Yeah, I love right? it. I love it. Yeah, I love. Um, Straight over. I think. Uh, I think it's, it is the traditional time of year where you get a lot of games going on and, and that doesn't bother me, to be fair. I like it. The family get used to it. And, and I think we've got the Edinburgh Derby on Boxing Day this year, so uh, that'll be a good crack, 12.30 game. We're going to talk about the Edinburgh Derby in a minute as well, but see, see the family and the missus, do they, do they watch games specifically to listen to you? Uh, no, they find yeah. it embarrassing listening to me, so uh, <laughs> they don't bother. They don't particularly like football, but sometimes they'll watch. Um, but... Nah, I, I told the missus I was doing Edinburgh Derby once and she asked why Edinburgh were playing Derby. So <laughs> at that point I decided to give up talking to her. Oh, I love that. Although perhaps with the, uh, you know, when, when, your job, when your hobby is your job, <laughs> which it is for me, perhaps yeah. that's what you need when you actually uh, get home, you need a bit of, you know, a bit of less football chat. So see the festive period, does that mean that you kind of really have the drinks that you want to? Not really, no. Uh, yeah, not quite to the level of uh, footballers taking it easy because, you know, I do like me a bit of red wine. Oh. 
Uh, so we have Shiraz. Some, uh, Would you like to be Shiraz? Malbec normally, oh, but I don't Malbec, mind a bit lovely. of Shiraz. Be yeah. an, Argent an Argentinian Malbec. Argentinian oh, Malbec. Oh, dearie me. Can't beat it. Uh, me and you after this. But yeah. Uh, me wine bar. Uh, yeah, it sounds Tremendous. good to me. But no, a um, few years back when I was at Satanta actually, we had a game on uh, on Boxing Day at lunchtime, so I had to drive up with Craig Burley, who was working with me. Right. He, was, he was living in Nottingham at the time, yeah. now in America. Um, Do you have his teeth in? Uh, yeah, yeah, he did, thankfully. Right. <laughs> but we drove up, I drove, picked him up in Nottingham, and we hit this fog up north, and uh, it was really bad. I remember Burley saying to me, you couldn't actually see 50 yards ahead, but he was going, it's Christmas Day night, there's nobody, nobody's going to be around. Speed up a bit. And I thought that, that could be our epitaph, uh, our final words. There's going to be nobody around in this fog on Christmas night. And there wasn't really, but it was... Um, so you ignored him? I ignored him and went slow, much to his annoyance. Good man. Uh, so, yeah, Christmas Day, you do take it a little bit easier. Uh, that's for sure, because you got the, the match the next day. And, and on some occasions, you do have to drive up or drive to a game on Christmas Day night, but there haven't been too many of them, thankfully. Yeah. Does that not put you off the job a wee bit? You need to do that Christmas? Nah, because there's times part, that you're thinking, is this worth it? It's part of, I always think it's worth it, yeah, it's part yeah. of the job. You've got to realise how lucky you are to be doing what you do, and I yeah. certainly do that. People say, you don't know how lucky you are, I do know how lucky I am. Um, so to me, that is a bit like getting stick on Twitter, it's part of the part of the territory. Well, um, man, yeah, you just let things roll, don't you, mate? Yeah, you've got to do it, you've got to take it easy, man, you've got to take it easy. That's why you look so young, you've not got a care in the world. <laughs> Here's not a job. I would say that, young, but... Uh, See, when you first started out, did you think you would get to this level? Um, I had belief in myself, yeah. I was working why? at the... Why? Why did you think you would do so well? I just think because if you don't believe in yourself, and this goes with anything in life, why would you expect other people to? I managed to try and get an interview with Roy Keane after one of the games. He'd done RTE, the Irish station. Yeah. Hardly ever did interviews. So I thought I'm going to try and get an interview with him. So uh, he finished his interview with RTE. He was on the same camera we were using. So I just stepped in and went, Roy, any chance of a quick word for Sky? He just stood there, staring straight ahead, didn't answer. So I said, uh, any chance of a quick word for Sky again? Same. Tried it a third time and he came right up close to me, right here, and just went, please. Like that. Because I never said please. So he's he, right. he had a point, but I thought if you're going to be told off, then he was muttering about manners. That's it, I'm sorry. And I thought if you're going to be told <laughs> off for bad manners, I don't mind being told off by a guy who was a fantastic player uh, to watch, one of the best I've seen in my time uh, watching football. So did he do it, no? He did the interview and oh, he, was, did he, right? he was brilliant. He just yeah. please, oh, brilliant eh? And at the end of the interview, they were playing Real Madrid in the next game midweek. At the end of the interview, I sarcastically gave it a uh, thank you very much, Roy, for doing the interview and best wishes against Real Madrid. And he kind of just went, oh. Thank you very much, you know. <laughs> um, but nah, but uh, Brilliant. what a guy, what a player. Uh, right, just back on to Sky. Sky didn't take up the rights for the Scottish Football League for a few years. Did you miss it? I did miss it, yeah, yeah. because by then I'd got so used to doing it. Um, yeah, I think we missed uh, four yeah, years. Yeah, that right, And um, at, during that time, though, I did the Championship in England, which was great fun, playoff finals and all that. So uh, that took a, a little bit. To, uh, and we still had Scottish Cup as well, so we were still doing that. So um, we had a good runner. I did 19 Scottish Cup finals, I think. Right. But as with always in TV, we, we haven't got the rights to that now. These things happen. But um, and I miss those because nothing like the one-off occasion for me. Uh, I do like a good cup final or a championship playoff final. So, so see, when you hear somebody else commentate on that Scottish Cup final, is it like when you seen your ex bird on another guy? Uh -huh. Well, <laughs> not quite like that, no. Uh, but I remember going to the last year's uh, last season's cup final. Right. And I just went to watch in the press box, and it was a. Really weird feeling having yeah. done uh, having done 19 of them to actually just be sit there watching and and it, I find it hard to sit and watch a game at a game mainly because you're always thinking also when something happens you're thinking oh uh, that was close but we'll see the replay in a minute oh no actually I won't because I'm not commentating on it no, no. <laughs> so um, it was a weird experience and uh, but like I say these things happen swings and roundabouts isn't it yeah. and uh, you know uh, rights change hands a lot uh, but generally. With Sky, we've they've been you know they've put a lot awful lot into Scottish football over the years. But you got a big money move to Satanta for a period of time. How big yeah. was that? A different well, experience. It wasn't that big, but not really because it was a lot of Sky people who went same there at the people, same time right. as well. So and it was all very similar. Some good guys and uh, enjoyable time. Um, but you know they went but bust. We'd, but we'd never do it again. No, I don't think so. But uh, <laughs> they went bust, so I had to go. Uh, was that your salary? That <laughs> I wish it was, but uh, I would say not. Does uh, Sky feel it a lot more like a natural home for Scottish football? I think so, yeah, because yeah. they've been doing it for so long. We get a bit of stick. Well, Sky gets a bit of stick. We all get a bit of stick. Um, but, you know, Sky have been right, a major yeah. uh, investor in Scottish football for a long, long time now and will continue to be so with an exclusive deal. Um, you know, they put, the, that right, sorry. they put the money into the game and, uh -huh. uh, 
you know, I know we've been around a long time, and you know, some people might think that's too long, but not at uh, all. I think it. I think it is, to be honest, the, the natural home of, uh, of Scottish football. Right. I need to ask you this before we're nearly at Hamden. It's been brilliant. I've loved it. <laughs> I need to ask you this. Sometimes commentators have the most obscure stats ever, man. Where, where where do you find this research? Where do you go to find this? We actually have a, a stats department at Sky who do produce a, what's called a stat pack for each game. Although over the years you've built up your own sort of lines as well and, and things like that. But yeah, generally you stumble across them. I've stumbled across a few things reading online newspapers and all that. Or our guys have uh, dug out a good stat. It's hard to remember one now, but... Um, you know, we uh, see when you get a an obscure stat, I thought, can you not wait to use it? You just wait for yes. the right moment. Uh-huh. Yeah, basically, uh-huh. it was uh, for a long time. There was a stat about the Oldham games actually, where it was something like you know the team scoring first had only lost something like two of the last 70, 80 odd Oldham games, which was remarkable, really, when you consider the those games. The pendulum can swing a lot in those games. Um, so I quite enjoyed that one. I always used to bung it in, in the first couple of minutes or so. But start as you mean to go on? Yeah, but that stat, uh, and there's the Scotland hat-trick stat stood for years, didn't they, until Scotland went and scored a couple of hat-tricks with Fletcher and Snodgrass and, Snodgrass and co and, and so on. Thanks, but, sorry, yeah. Sorry, mate. Yeah. Uh, just, uh, you mentioned the Ed- Edinburgh derbies earlier. How good are they? I love the Edinburgh derbies. I love the Edinburgh derbies, yeah. we got one Boxing Day. I love any derby. And um, it's, a sh- it's a shame to see Hibs and Hearts uh, where they are at the moment because they're so much better than that. But yeah. not that the table lies. You know, they, des- they deserve to be down there by the way they've played this season. But, yeah, I love the Edinburgh derbies and uh, you'll appreciate this as well. The Dundee derbies for me. Oh, yeah. tremendous. I find the oh, atmosphere, you would, right? I played in a Dundee derby. You'd have commentated that, now. I probably, probably did. Did you touch the ball? <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> first sub. First sub. <laughs> uh, uh, I must have commentated on you. Uh, one of those. But I find the Dundee derbies great. They're, everyone's right up for those. And, uh, you know, yeah, the, uh, the more derbies, the merrier. Just love them. Who's side uh, Celtic and Rangers? Favourite player that you've watched, commentated on? Scotland, is there one that springs to mind? Out of the, in Scotland generally? Yeah, out, no, outside the Celtic and Rangers, yeah. Oh, outside the Celtic and Rangers. Tremendous That's, question, uh, huh? It might have been you that day of the Dundee Derby. <laughs> you one touch uh, on the ball. Um, yeah, that's a good one. Well, there's been a few. Scatcher was quite good at Hearts. Oh, hard to hear. Russell Latterby at Hibs. What a player. He was a hell of a player, wasn't he? I'd probably go for Russell if I was pushed, actually, because, uh, because of that 6-2 game. It was ironic that we had the 6-2 Glasgow Derby and then a couple of months later the 6-2 Edinburgh Derby. Um, when Mixie scored a hat-trick, didn't he? But Russell Latterby scored that. Oh, so he did the Dunstein Twisting, turning, day, yeah, yeah. scoring goal, which was... Uh, Fabulous. Yeah, I apologise to Hearts now, having started off apologising <laughs> to Ray. Right, last question on this travel. Dream car share four passengers for a long distance journey to Ross County. Who would it be? <laughs> You're hoping to get in, aren't you? No, huh? no, 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 I'm no, never no. getting in, I'm never getting in, I'm never getting in. <laughs> Does it have to be football people or? Anyone oh, you like, mate, you pick whoever probably you like. I'll stick to football, I think. Right, um, go for it. Jonathan Pierce, because he'd bring loads of sweets. Percy, yeah, well, I worked with Percy Capital. He, he got me into Capital oh, many years right? ago, so yeah. But uh, no, I wouldn't want to listen to Percy for four hours, to uh, be fair. Give a paracetamol so head. Yeah, I heard uh, enough of him. I <laughs> uh, heard enough of him going back over the years. Um, I'd probably stick to football people. And um, if I stick to Scotland, mainly, I'd probably go for Walter and Martin O'Neill. As, oh, as brilliant. That'd go- be a good combo. would be a good chat, wouldn't it? And uh, imagine some of the stories as well. And I'd probably stick my hero growing up, Billy Bonds, in there as well right. from uh, West Ham because uh, Bonzo is just a straightforward kind of guy who'd uh, speak his mind uh, and so on. So I'd probably uh, stick with him as well. And One more. One more. Um, uh, one more. I'll probably keep with the West Ham theme and go for Tony Gale. Right. Gailey's one of the funniest men in football. He's on Sky Sports Tony Gale. He's good. Yeah, he? he's one of the funniest guys. He tells a great. He got sent off in the FA Cup semi final by Keith Hackett. Remember the referee? Yeah, yeah, yeah. At Villa Park, Forrest ended up beating West Ham four 0 His best chance to make it to a final, and uh, he was given a. Well, I consider I might be biased as a harsh red card early in the game, and Forrest under Cloughy went on and romped it. And uh, he was asked years later to do uh, an interview with Keith Hackett about it on a podcast. And um, he said, nah, he goes, that guy ruined my life, ruined my chance of playing in the cup final. And the people running the podcast said, listen, we'll give you £10,000 for it. And Gailey went, what time do you want me there? <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant. So I'd have Gailey in for the patter. Tremendous. Uh, talking a podcast, open goal, get on it.
<laughs> you need to start listening to that big money. I know, it's... I uh, know it's just not in the car anyway, what's happening? Well, it's a wife's car, isn't it? She right, doesn't, okay, doesn't, right. doesn't do you. football. I, Good man. I'll start, uh, I'll start downloading a few. Good man. Right, we're back at Hamden. Just a wee bit about the cup finals that we've had here. Best cup final memories at Hamden. I think you mentioned the Hibs first time in... Yeah, I think Hibs... I mean, the Rangers' last-minute winner against Celtic in 2002 was dramatic, but that was quite a long time ago now. And I think Hibs, because of the fact they hadn't won the cup for 114 years... And I remember in the, when they were 2 0 down at Hearts in their first tie in that competition yeah. and scored twice in the last 10 minutes, came back to 2 2. I remember saying to Luke Shanley, reporter, uh, this is going to be Hibbs year, that's it. And I kept saying it all the way and all the way. And I said it before the game. In fact, I did a piece for the match day programme for that cup final right. and said, you know, the day's got to happen. It's got to happen one day when Hibbs win the Scottish Cup. And I said I'd quite like to be around for it because no competitor's been able to say it for 114 years. Oh, of course, so it'd be great one, huh? for it to happen on my watch. Greedy, selfish commentators again. <laughs> Sorry, Rangers. But, and, it, and it was a fantastic final. And then, of course, it comes to the corner moment with Henderson yeah. to deliver. But what pleased me more, I quite enjoyed the commentary because I thought I captured the moment and Hibs fans have got tattoos and ringtones and sung songs about it and all that, which is humbling, if a bit embarrassing. But just before that corner's taken by Liam Henderson, I said, what a moment this is. And I don't even remember saying it at the time. And it might not have been a moment at all if they hadn't scored. Yeah. Who knows what would have happened in extra time. Or So I was quite pleased with that. And, uh, Can you even remember saying that at the time? Don't yeah? remember no. saying it. Don't remember saying it. It was Luke, actually, who told me about it afterwards. And I said, I just don't remember saying that. But it, it fitted perfectly. Um, so sometimes it's the things you don't remember or don't think about that are completely off the cuff. I remember saying Hibs are standing on the brink of history because I thought, crikey, when it was 2-2, if Hibs get a winner, I've got to have something to say here. Normally, you don't. Normally, you do ad lib, but sometimes you have it in your mind, kind of what you're going to say. And that day, everything kind of worked on that Hibs winner for me. It certainly worked for them. Mm-hmm. And um, so I would say, as a one-off moment, that is probably there. But there, there have been so many over the years. And how fitting that um, David Gray, who's got years like the Scottish Cup, scored the winner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, appropriate. And, uh, it, it was funny because the, the, the Scottish Cup final went on a sequence of late goals being scored at that end in the, and running to that corner. I think yeah. Rogic did the same year after for Celtic, if I remember correctly. So on a bit of a run of that. But yeah, David Gray, the captain scoring, kind of added to it. And, uh, you know, it, obviously what happened after the full time whistle was a bit of a shame, but uh, well, a lot of a shame actually because we weren't talking about the game. But I always talk about the game because it was just fantastic. And, uh, you know, Andy Halliday scored a screamer in that game, didn't he, for yeah. ages, which hardly gets, which obviously gets, never gets mentioned either. But yeah. uh, it was just. Uh, did you join great. in, Sunshine and Leaf? Uh, I didn't join in, but one thing I did do, which is unusual for me, we were still on coverage at the time. And the thing I did was I didn't speak because I didn't think I needed to. So we let the Hibs fans with Sunshine on Leaf just sing. Oh, and yeah. and I, honestly, that's some of the most emotional telly I think I've seen in terms of covering live sport. And funny enough, it didn't need the words of a commentator. People always say I talk too much. They might have had a point. So I just we just let it go, and we let the fans go singing Sunshine on Leaf. 114 years put into that version of that day of that song. Great song, by the way. You want to sing it now? Uh, no, ah, I, don't, I don't think I'm going to. It was broken. I'll leave it to you, but <laughs> it was just it, just, it proved to me one thing, that sometimes when you shut up and let fans take it, I try not to talk over teams walking out either, because the natural noise of the fans going like that, you don't need anything to add to it. So uh, commentators probably do the best work when they're not actually talking. How bizarre. Brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, last question, Ian. Uh, hope to continue the commenting game as long as you can. Hope so, yeah. Um, as long as the voice holds out and as long as uh, you know, people continue to give me work, Sky in the main. But yeah, it's one of those jobs that, I mean, some guys go on into their, well into their late 60s and 70s. And um, I mean, I actually went on forever doing games and this and that. Once you've got the bug, you don't want to give it up. When commentators are generally, as I've mentioned, quite selfish. Um, like that time I was ill, I didn't want to let anyone else do the game, which is terrible when you can hardly speak. But um, no, I would happily go on as, as long as is humanly possible because nothing quite beats the buzz of going to a game, commentating on it, sitting down with a glass of red wine after and, and chilling. Big crocker, Spaniel, what a man. Enjoy that, my man. Thanks, you get that. I got this interview in luck. You give it a few years <laughs> and you'll, right. be, uh, you'll be really good at it. Co comms, me and you, like Scotland, you're all right, mate. All right, you in. Thanks, mate. Cheers, mate. See ya. <laughs> Take care, fella. In the time it takes to score a goal, you can also lose control. Don't speed, drive smart. smart.